which we decided we need to have it in chennai in honor and celebration of a historic event that is scheduled to happen beginning tomorrow i must at the outset confess my ignorance on indo china relationship issues nor am i an expert in defense trade geopolitics and the only qualification that i have to stand before you to welcome this gathering is as a representative of one of the organizers representing shastra university and uh, along with vivekananda international foundation wanted to welcome this very distinguished uh, gathering and both the institutions that have come together to organize this event in my opinion we have a lot of things to share not only in the name but also the work that we are doing shastra in its name and the work we are doing in the field of higher education with a focus on indian ethos values and the vivekananda international foundation again in the name doing tremendous work in multi dimensional areas touching very critical areas of research which includes the civilizational strategic assets of india and i am extremely happy happy that both these organizations have gotten together to conduct this event as i mentioned before in honor of an important event that is going to happen in the historic town of mahabalipuram tomorrow which many have started writing about and since this is the second informal summit after the wuhan one which was the first there is no prescripted agenda for this meet and many of them have written so much that so many issues are going to be discussed and it is all in their own assessment and wisdom and i thought in my welcome address i will also share my personal expectation of this informal summit and also leave a question to the panel for them to answer not this not that this is going to be the discourse of this panel discussion but at least one small question that i want to leave with the panel to also address as part of the panel discussion sir you see this informal summit as i mentioned before has given us no agenda as to what the issues would be discussed but one thing that i feel is going to strongly bind these heads of states and the countries is that they represent two 
big economies that inherit a civilizational legacy along with them and in my view and in my humble expectation i feel that the narrative of this informal summit if it is having contours around the civilizational assets of these two nations there will definitely be a lot of common areas of good that can promote the bilateral ties between india and china that is my only expectation because i strongly believe that both have inherited a civilizational legacy that has a glorious past and if these both nations can come forward and celebrate there is no doubt at the geopolitical level there is going to be a glorious future for both these nations many civilizations have come and gone and many of them we see in museums and libraries and artifacts but here are two civilizations which are not just having very rich civilizational assets but more visible in the way in which they are functioning as societies and this is something that i feel that we need to build some coherent synergy moving the discussions forward to promote bilateral ties between india and china and that is my humble request to the panel to also see if you can touch the civilizational contours of india and china and how both of these countries can leverage and enrich the civilizational assets which is special because of the continuum that both these countries have inherited and the nation state theory evolves from such civilizational assets and both of them have a great future because of a greater civilizational past with this brief backdrop i welcome all of you and i welcome in particular these three distinguished panelists who definitely know who definitely need no introduction but as a formality let me first begin by welcoming dr arvind gupta the director of the vivekananda international foundation a original thinker a very distinguished person rich years of experience in the foreign service he was the former deputy national security advisor and also the director general of the institute for defense studies and analysis he has represented the country in various diplomatic machines he has authored a number of books an expert on international and indian defense and security and a number of other areas that touch upon various critical areas of geopolitics he is a frequent contributor to various journals and newspapers and as i said before an original thinker in his own right a very thought provoking speaker as well followed by ambassador mr tc rangachari again a familiar face for a chennai audience former ambassador to three countries algeria france and germany very distinguished service in foreign services represented the country in uh, pakistan and also briefly in china and uh, was also involved in various un missions also was involved in the ministry of external affairs and ministry of finance as well and a very distinguished scholar himself with loads of experience in handling international issues so that's ambassador mr rangachari for you and the third speaker for the day professor dr shrikant khandopalli professor in chinese studies from the jawaharlal nehru university a very scholarly academic focusing on china his phd was on chinese studies a sort of an academic on indo china relations he's been visiting almost all the major universities in china in different capacities for over two decades in the past a very distinguished scholar himself and uh, the fourth term heading the center for asian studies at the jawaharlal nehru university a very distinguished author and a prolific writer in various popular dailies of the country so ladies and gentlemen we have assembled here 
three people who have an aggregated wisdom of over 100 years amongst themselves to talk, talk about two countries whose national identities have a combined age of over 140 years but definitely their civilizational identities put together have an age that runs to thousands of years and it is a very rare opportunity for all of us to listen to this 100 years of combined wisdom and i'm extremely happy to welcome all of you on behalf of the vivekananda international foundation and shastra university and for my chinese friends who are sitting here don't mind my pronunciation wan chong hao and huan ying thank you two great civilizations both oriental wonders have poised to create what is widely now being termed the asian century in more than six decades the indo-china relationship has transcended friendship periods of soft renewal dialogue and episodal changes and has now evolved itself to result at a historic meeting at mamallapuram the seafaring heritage town in samas from now indeed the dragon and tiger have come full circle to chair today's panel and start the discussion by setting the context it is my pleasure to request dr arvind gupta director vivekananda international foundation to take the floor namaskar good afternoon to everyone first of all i want to thank the vice chancellor for the words of welcome and for very warm hospitality that uh, sastra university has given to us and it's really a pleasure to be here in uh, chennai and uh, talk to a different crowd of course in delhi we meet uh, very often and discuss these subjects but the change of locale and now at a very Uh, important moment i think in the history of uh, sino indian relations it's wonderful uh, to be here and uh, to be with you and uh, have some time for this uh, exchange of uh, uh, views uh so whether subramaniam and i have been talking about the whole collaboration between the vivekananda international foundation and uh, sastra for some time so i'm glad that uh, he took the initiative and uh, brought us here and uh, we hope that uh, this uh, is just a beginning and uh, we will continue to have uh, more academic uh, exchanges and uh, i also learned that uh, amrit was at the vif some 3 4 years ago as an uh, intern and uh, wrote a paper so it's not that uh, the uh, collaboration has not been there but it has been picked up now and this is a very good moment to really start uh, that uh, collaboration and deepen it further we very happy to have people from uh, shastra university at the vif and likewise we'll also like and send uh, uh, people uh, here i think uh, this uh, exchange between different academic institutions who have different backgrounds but perhaps that uh, common aim uh, of uh, producing uh, students informed discussions based on indian civilization and indian ethos civilizational values i think that is something very important uh, i'm also uh, very thankful to ambassador rangachari and uh, professor shrikant kondapalli who at a very short notice literally a notice of about 2 days uh, they agreed uh, readily uh, to uh, be here uh, for uh, this uh, very important uh, uh, seminar now you started uh, by emphasizing the civilizational 
uh, aspects of uh, uh, sino indian relations and i think you did a very good uh, thing you pointed out that uh, uh, the civilizational contacts if you look at uh, the rela- present relationship from the lens of civilization probably you will reach different conclusions then if you look at the relationship from purely nation state and uh, geopolitical uh, lens of course both are very important and uh, i would say that uh, the uh, wuhan summit which uh, took place the first informal summit which uh, took place in uh, 2018 uh that had set up a, a high level mechanism uh which was chaired by which is chaired at the level of levels of uh, the foreign ministers to precisely look at this aspect of uh, cultural and people to people contacts and the two meetings of uh, that have already been held within a space of about 8 9 months and they have already worked they realized the importance of the civilizational and cultural context they have already identified about uh, 10 areas for cooperation uh, they have identified about 100 activities that uh, they would be doing uh, and i think the exchange of uh, the students that is taking place a large number of indian students i think more than 10000 students are already studying in china and uh, Chinese students are also studying in India. In fact, in the flight, I had a young lady who is studying Hindi and doing her PhD. And I was, to, she was talking in fluent Hindi, and she said that there are a number of people, students like her, who are already coming and uh, uh, to India and studying Indian culture, literature, and so forth. So uh, I think this is beginning to happen, and this is very important because. geopolitics is a totally different uh, game there the national interests uh, are absolutely supreme and uh, sometimes uh, there are convergences sometimes there are divergences and we have seen that in sino indian relations uh, it's a story of uh, uh, largely divergences but some convergences also and there has been a assiduous uh, effort on both sides to highlight the areas of convergences and build on those but there are other issues as well which continue and one cannot uh, overlook them because then it's not uh, if you don't talk about uh, difficult issues uh, or your problems then the relationship uh, is also somewhat shallow in that case but you bring in culture you bring in people to people you bring in civilization perhaps it becomes easier to talk about even uh, difficult issues so i think this addition of uh, culture the focus on culture civilization uh, that is uh, very important and this particular uh, uh, meeting which is the uh, second uh, meeting being held in uh, mamalapuram uh, is a, a great optics for that uh, highlighting the civilization and cultural contact uh, that doesn't mean that they will not be talking about uh, the uh, other issues the routine issues and also new issues because the whole concept of this informal summits which is in some sense is a uh, innovation in the sino indian relations the whole concept has been to uh, highlight these uh, uh, long standing uh, cultural con- uh, uh, contacts but also look at new areas if you look at the statements which were issued uh, by both sides uh, after the uh, wuhan uh, summit it was very clear that uh, that there is a desire on both sides to look into new areas of cooperation and take the sino indian relationship to a new level and to prepare a blueprint for that so that has been the motivation behind uh, this and of course exchange views on uh, their uh, you know non uh, geopolitical issues and uh, come to know of each other's uh, uh, assessments about the situation but going to that higher level of relationship and identifying new areas has been one of the uh, motivations 
and when the uh, external affairs minister he went to uh, beijing uh, uh, recently in uh, august and the assessment that was which was after the you know this 370 thing that had happened the assessment there was again that the wuhan process or the wuhan spirit that uh, started has already yielded positive results and this constant contact in a informal summit uh, in informal uh, manner helps to uh, with no agenda as you said but helps to look at any issue in fact no agenda means you can look at practically any other issue and this is a new way of uh, uh, dealing uh, this is a new way of uh, uh, the people at the top level taking decisions and perhaps uh, trying and uh, nipping the problem in the bird where they are and also at the same time finding solutions to the problems which exist and also identifying new areas and also giving the strategic guidance to the other people who have to deal with other uh, issues so this has been the process i think it's a new process and from this uh, meeting uh, which is going to take place uh, tomorrow and day after there are quite naturally uh, high expectations now i think we should also uh, look at uh, uh, the what has happened firstly why did this process one process start and what has happened since then to get an idea of what might happen uh, here today very briefly the doklam incident that happened in uh, 2017 that certainly was a setback for bilateral relations and if uh, there was a need to uh, repair the relationship and that is how the wuhan uh, uh, informal summit uh, took place since wuhan until today while there have been as i said high level mechanism meetings and some other uh, uh, positive uh, developments but uh, at the same time i think there have also been some developments which need uh, whose impact has been somewhat of a setback and i think this uh, summit will also give a chance to both the sides to look at what what has happened and uh, how to uh, proceed and uh, uh, go further apart from discussing the normal issues of trade and so on and these setbacks are essentially of uh, of uh, two developments which are very important here one was uh, the uh, pulwama uh, at, you know terrorist uh, attacks and the, the indian uh, response to balakot and uh, that uh, uh, you know brought pakistan in a very big way into the india um, the, of course india pakistan relations that assumed very high importance but also it became an issue in a sense uh, in the sino indian relations the second thing has uh, that has happened which is also very important and that is the abrogation of article 370 and uh, the subsequent statements uh, which have been issued uh, by the chinese side and the statement of uh, the foreign minister wang yi at uh, the uh, unga uh, where they have referred to uh, uh, un that the uh, issue should be resolved uh, by between india and pakistan that is by Uh, not only by the two means but also there was a reference to the un uh, security council resolutions so that is something very new and that has certainly uh, uh, kind of uh, come as a surprise uh, to uh, us because this reference to un security council resolutions in chinese statements has uh, at least to my mind uh, has not been there at least in the recent past but my colleagues might be able to say so i think there is something to uh, uh, talk about it even yesterday there was uh, uh, a joint press release uh, which has been issued by uh, after the uh, visit of uh, uh, imran khan prime minister imran khan to beijing where again these formulations have been repeated that is the reference to the un security council resolution etc now this obviously uh, and our our spokes person also has issued some statements uh, uh, in the last few days so if left to this this statement and so on i think it can create problems so whether 
this issue will come up on uh, uh, in the uh, uh, summit uh, informal summit of course remains to be seen but certainly this is the backdrop for, uh, that is in, in which uh, this is happening and we should really be uh, mindful of this uh, very important development this is not to say that there is no uh, positive agenda i am sure there are quite a lot of uh, things uh, uh, the, which will be discussed and will have a positive thing but the background uh, to the summit is very important and i think the two leaders will have to take uh, uh, stock of the uh, situation another aspect of uh, this uh, summit uh, would be i think uh, because sino indian relationship is not just a bilateral relationship on trade economics politics science technology that and so on it is a much it is the backdrop to sino indian relationship is equally important our two leaders have already met i think about 10 times in the last uh, probably two years or so so there is already a, a lot of contact that is taking place and it's happening and they are also part of uh, other forums like the russia india china forum they are also there in the uh, shanghai cooperation organization forum incidentally it was at the uh, seo bishkek when the prime minister uh, which happened in uh, uh, june uh, when the prime minister issued Uh, when invited uh, uh, President Xi Jinping to uh, come to India for an uh, informal summit, and he uh, uh, readily agreed. So the leaders have been meeting bilaterally and also at the multilateral fora, and at these multilateral fora and regional fora, a lot of things are discussed, and they are also looking at the world as what is the shape of the world that is emerging, and what is the role India and China can play. and they are also looking at the situation uh, in the neighborhood in the indian ocean and so many other places and these are also extremely important factors which uh, impact the sino indian relationship at the same time sino indian relationship also impacts this global and the regional situation so those issues uh, also uh, need to be discussed and of course the issues of uh, trade Uh, is also very important and i just want to end with just making one comment you see uh, if you look at uh, the statements which were issued uh, uh, after wuhan two separate statements were issued no joint statement was issued two separate statement one by india one by uh, china and there was a mention of the boundary question in those uh, statements and uh, no boundary question remains a very important uh, uh, issue between india and china and they have done a lot over the last uh, two decades uh, how to maintain peace and tranquility in the border build confidence building with the etc but the issue is not yet resolved the uh, both statements issued after the wuhan uh, summit they did talk about the boundary and they said that the special representatives would uh, uh, work on uh, 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 this issue and in fact the indian statement talked about in the two special representatives will intensify their efforts to come up with some kind of a uh, you know discuss and come up with some kind of a solution the chinese statement only noted the fact but uh, omitted the word intensify now i think boundary question one model has been that let's leave this aside just maintain peace and tranquility and not touch it because it's a very difficult complex question it can have an impact on the overall uh, relationship and relationship is multidimensional so that's one model the other model is that so long as this remains the relationship will remain somewhat stunted in a way it, i mean it will not the full potential of the relationship might not be realized so should we not try and dissolve it after all we have been discussing this for now several decades in fact uh, probably almost two generations so whether this will happen now i mean the informal summit process has taken note of the boundary question now whether this will happen again at the mamalapuram or no i do not know that is of course in the time will tell but this is something that uh, will also be uh, to my mind this is an important issue and if some kind of a strategic guidance ensues uh, as it happened in uh, uh, the first uh, wuhan summit at least from the indian Uh, statement and the reading of the indian statement it seems it was discussed and there was a desire to intensify but i think the uh, interpretation on the other side was somewhat uh, different 
let us see what happens uh, in this mamalapuram of course they may decide to completely uh, set aside and not discuss about it whether kashmir will be discussed or no i do not know after all the statements have been made on both sides but uh, india also feels that it's an internal issue so but if there is a clarification to be sought they may be able to provide a clarification but it may not be raised from the indian side but these are all speculations we do, really don't know what would happen so i think i'll stop here just to flag a few points and i'm sure uh, the other panelists would have much more to add here now i uh, change the sequence a, a little bit and first request uh, professor shrikant konnapalli to make his remarks thank you very much and um uh, good evening to you all um the vice chancellor spoke about the civilizational links that we need to promote in this um informal summit meeting the second informal summit meeting i think that's a very uh, important point because in the living civilizations um both india and china today count substantially uh in terms of a continuous cultural aspects for 2 to 3000 years um despite modernization despite a lot of other um, uh, issues impacting on cultural relations there's been a, a common trend both in china as well as in india of the influence of this culture which has been uh, there for centuries for example 40% of chinese believe in buddhism uh, and many chinese communist party members believe in buddhism uh, and they are also practicing uh, buddhist uh, they do go to the monasteries they do all as well uh, do as several of the rituals um, uh, ancestral worship is a commonality uh, when you go to the temple of confucius in chufu in shantung province uh, the entrance to the temple has a um, a slogan uh, in chinese it is wan shu shu piao basically for 10000 generations you are my teacher that's what it basically uh, translates to uh, which indicates that any chinese who go abroad still will consider the lineages as part of their Uh, heritage uh, and hence the ancestral worship is very important for them for many even though uh, there is the impact of uh, the communist party socialism modernity uh, and so on still the rituals the tomb cleaning festival um, which uh, which is a major festival uh, uh, they clean up the tomb of their ancestors so people migrate people go far away and do this uh, in order to obey respect their ancestors uh, this is one uh, then there is also the uh, dragon boat festival only recently there was the festival that was uh, concluded about 2 3 months ago in roughly in june this year um, which is again attracts a lot of people in china um then there are other uh, during spring festival you cannot simply travel in china there will be 4 to 500 million people uh, on the road on the railways on the airport in the airports um nearly to one third of chinese are moving during the spring festival that comes somewhere in january february uh, so so that the uh, what i was trying to drive at is that these cultural traits are still part of the chinese moorings uh, we all know as indians we uh, do uh, celebrate our festivals uh, only uh, a day before the dashara and various other cultural uh, aspects uh, the civilizational link is very very important and let me here congratulate chennai and the neighborhood mahabalipuram uh, for hosting the second informal summit meeting previously there was a speculation that varanasi will host the second informal summit meeting uh, but then the chance was given to chennai and to mahabalipuram to host this uh, very important meeting here 
um this is important because historically the pallava empire the chola empire had uh, a huge maritime imprint across the indian ocean south china sea southeast asia uh, and a host of other places uh, for centuries there has been that cultural impact into the southern seas as the chinese call nanyang as the chinese call so there is a um, uh, a huge civilizational impact as the vice chancellor mentioned now informal summit meetings uh, are um, necessary when we get stuck in the formal meetings uh, this is one of the uh, crucial mechanisms many follow you may have seen the um uh, in globally you have seen many of these meetings uh, which have yielded a lot of results positive results um uh, for example in west asia for example in between soviet union and the us before uh, or uh, the other major countries uh, the formal meetings uh, there is a structured meeting two and a half three hours and Uh, between china and india the translators would obviously take time in interpreting these uh, so in other words the the leader has no time to talk to the other leader uh, in formal structured meetings the informal summit meetings have this um, you know the ball is rolling the conversation ball is rolling uh, you can pick up any topic you discuss those of concern Uh, so it provides for a lot of maneuverability it provides for a lot of um, flexibility for the leaders to discuss issues and then come come to some conclusion or a con- consensus uh, between the two sides uh, so when this was proposed during the shanghai cooperation organization meeting in 2017 the uh, both sides agreed to hold this in wuhan which is by the way the hometown of the former chinese ambassador luo chaohui who was in new delhi four days ago to prepare for this uh, informal summit meeting uh, so if the first is any guide for the second informal summit meeting uh, what has happened in the first meeting and what has been the progress uh, um, i think they discussed about 10 issues of which five issues have become part of the public uh, knowledge we do not know about the other five it is not in the public domain the five issues which have been advertised talked about uh, include number one strategic communication between the leaderships uh, and in the last one and a half years since the wuhan meeting we have seen a number of uh, interactions uh, for example general wei feng he visited uh, india as the defense minister um uh, mrs nirmala sitharaman hosted when she was the defense minister then um and they discussed about the hotline between the two armed forces there was some disagreement in relation to the new confidence building measures that need to be put up between the two armed forces yet that is a work in progress uh then we have travel latru the uh, politburo standing committee member responsible for security issues internal security issues uh, he is the seventh politburo standing committee member he came we discussed the counter terrorism issues we discussed a host of other uh, aspects um as you know the uh, chinese have yielded on the masood azhar being listed in the 1267 committee of the united nations security council so there is some progress on that as well uh then there is the visit by uh, foreign minister state councilor wang yi in december last year and a 10 pillar agreement was signed in terms of the people to people contacts and cultural relations which mr jay shankar uh in august had concluded a second uh, round as ambassador gupta had just mentioned now these visits uh, are important to exchange um, information communication so on so forth between the leaderships so this is one where there is a lot of progress so possibly this will be emphasized tomorrow uh, between the two leaders the second issue which was mentioned in public domain is the border stability 
uh, after the doklam incident this has become a major contentious issue in the light of uh, hardly any progress in the uh, discussions on resolving the territorial problem um, and new cbms have been proposed during the 2017 september brics meeting in shaman uh, but there was again some disagreement on what kind of cbms to be followed uh, since 1993 pv narsimha rao's visit we have had stepped up confidence building matches 93 96 2013 different cbms have been proposed many of these actually been implemented uh, on the ground level for example border personal meetings for example uh, the joint military operations hand in hand joint operations uh, or between the navy search and rescue operations uh, and in the air force the surakiran acrobatic Uh, you know maneuvers uh, there are several other cbms which have been uh, conducted between the two sides so the border stability issue has become the second uh, major important aspect in the discussions at wuhan which is again likely to be discussed tomorrow because in between we have had the fish tails incident in arunachal pradesh uh, and also the the pankungso lake incident which was resolved quickly as part of the cbms agreement that we have had in between so uh, nevertheless two rising countries uh, as the vice chancellor mentioned china has about 13.8 trillion dollars of gdp uh, and growing at around 6 6.4% although some chinese think that the chinese growth rates are about 1.67% last year Uh, for example a people's university uh, teacher uh, professor xiang uh, considered the chinese growth rates at around 1.67 last year uh, another uh, professor chang from the beijing university also considered the growth rate is around 3% while another uh, again from beijing university uh, michael pratis also suggested that the growth rates are relatively coming down in china uh, which also means that there is a um, a need for improving relations with the neighborhood with india in particular where india is uh, maintaining a relatively higher growth rate so to that extent there has the situation changed in the last one one and a half year uh, in terms of the uh, tariff wars that the united states has been waging the third issue that they discussed is linked to the what we just mentioned in terms of the uh, reducing trade deficits uh, in the last 10 years the trade deficits between india and china amounted to 726 billion dollars that is in simple language india lost about 726 billion dollars in its trade with china uh, from a pure economic point of view there is a demand there is a supply somebody sold somebody purchased so it is uh, a market mechanism uh, but trump is saying he is not an economist he is the president of the united states and so he had imposed several tariffs 25% tariffs on over 350 billion dollars of products from china Mr Jay Shankar alluded to a trade conflict emerging between India and China. Uh, Ambassador Misri or Ambassador to China also alluded to a kind of trade war emerging between the two. In the light of this uh, and since President Pratibha Patil's visit to China in May 2010 the trade deficits issue has become a political issue in India as well. although the other side has not been listening to what india has been saying since 2010 india raised the trade deficit issue and suggested three four alternatives number one is removing the non tariff barriers in the china market uh, for example there are so many non tariff barriers under wto world trade organization no uh, those contracting parties cannot have any uh trade barriers they have to have free movement of goods and uh services so in other words the uh, indian side is saying that indian pharmaceuticals should be 
sold in the China market. Uh, likewise, Indian software packages should be adopted in state-owned enterprises. So far, no state-owned enterprise in China has Indian software. Uh, and in some cases, the TCS, uh, Tata Consultancy Service, was barred from having a software upgradation in Shanghai Stock Exchange uh, several years ago. Uh, likewise, there are other barriers for these. So what India is suggesting is, number one, remove those non-tariff barriers uh, on the Indian products. Um, secondly, it is suggesting that China should invest in the Indian market given the huge trade deficits uh, between the two sides. Um, so, the, uh, in fact, the number of announcements have been very um, uh, important. Uh, when President Xi Jinping came to um, India in September 2014, he announced $20 billion investment for the next five years. So we are now in 2013 after five years. The total cumulative investment by China in the last five years is $2 billion. Uh, and the total cumulative investment of China in the last 17 years is $8 billion. For a country with $13.8 trillion GDP uh, and in a country which is maintaining a growth rate of nearly 7%, 6 to 7 percent, 8 billion dollars uh, is a very paltry, if not even, not even a paltry amount. Uh, given the trade deficits and the larger political uh, issues that arise out of these trade deficits, tomorrow you likely see uh, President Xi Jinping announcing another 8 billion dollar investment in India, uh, which is likely. But we need to see whether these remain as announcements or whether they will actually be uh, implemented on the ground. Uh, when Prime Minister Modi went to Beijing in May 2015, $32 billion was promised by various uh, CEOs and others. Uh, again, out of this, we received about $2 billion so far. Um, so in other words, this is a major contentious issue on the investment portion. The fourth issue that was discussed in Wuhan included uh, any collaborative projects that India and China can do in Afghanistan. Uh, so, so far, there has not been much progress in Afghanistan, partly because both China and India actually do not have much hold over the Afghan developments. Uh, there is the uh, uncertainty and instability uh, in, the, in the region, and hence this is beyond their control. Uh, nevertheless, they also began the diplomatic training program. The Foreign Service uh, Services Institution in New Delhi conducted some uh, uh, training programs for the Afghan diplomats, which were addressed by the Chinese ambassador uh, to New Delhi, to India. Uh, so that was, again, a, an issue which probably will also be raised tomorrow because the uh, the situation in Afghanistan determines many events in Xinjiang, in Kashmir, in a host of others in the neighborhood. So it is likely to have a major impact on the uh, both Chinese security as well as Indian security. A fifth issue is the people-to-people -people contacts and cultural relations, which has already been mentioned in terms of uh, Mr. Wang, Wang Yi's visit uh, and the Ten Pillar Agreement. Um, there is a realization that both India and China need to do more in terms of tourism. Last year, we had something like 1.9 million, that is 19 lakh Indians going to China. Uh, on the other hand, there is about 3 lakh Chinese coming to India. Um, E-visas have been instituted. There is a host of other uh, incentives were given. Uh, yet, tourism is not picking up from the other side. So, it is likely to be uh, a major issue tomorrow that will be raised, discussed uh, on tourism front. Um, last year, China had seen 160 million Chinese going abroad. Uh, out of this, uh, about 3 lakh came to India. Uh, and hence, there is a huge potential in this regard in terms of tourism expansion. 
Then there is also the um, the youth exchanges, the uh, museum management, uh, media media forum, think tank forum. Four such media forum have been conducted so far, uh, and there is a lot of flow from Indian journalists, Indian media personnel, as well as Chinese media personnel. Some of them here in this room. Uh, the think tank forum meetings also were very significant because the uh, ICWA, Indian Council for World Affairs, the VIF, uh, and most of other institutions are involved in this think tank forum meetings. Uh, in order to arrive at something, uh, an elite consensus on many issues of concern on both sides. Uh, so these are some. Apart from these five issues, um, President Xi and Prime Minister Modi are likely to discuss various other aspects as well. Uh, you may have noticed that Foreign Minister Jai Shankar visited New York uh, and he attended the Foreign Ministerial meeting of the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue. Uh, you have also seen uh, uh, Imran Khan's visit to China and the joint statement issued yesterday, as Ambassador Gupta mentioned. Uh, it included the items which are not palatable to India. Uh, so there is this contention between the two sides on the Indo-Pacific, although Prime Minister Modi in the Shangri-La Dialogue invited every other country, in other words, uh, suggested to inclusivity, provided they agree to rule of law, they agree to freedom of navigation and uh, overflight uh, in the high seas. Uh, they agree to maritime security, maritime connectivity. They agree to counter-terrorism. They agree to uh, the uh, free and open, uh, meaning that this should not be controlled by any one single power. Uh, so this has been the theme of Prime Minister Modi's speech in Shangri-La last June. Uh, so to that extent, there is uh, a kind of uh, uh, reaching out to China in this regard. Uh, or to other countries in the Indo-Pacific region. A middle path approach, a Buddhist middle path approach uh, was suggested in a way, citing again the civilizational links. Uh, we need to see how China would respond. China would, would it respond to a balance of power approach, uh, a modern balance of power approach, or in a civilizational manner. There are also many other issues that probably they would be discussing. Uh, including uh, the two items that also bring India and China together in globalization and multipolarity. Uh, globalization, there is so much that is happening between the two countries and in the light of the uh, tariff wars uh, intensifying, there is, a, there is an uncertainty in trade, investments, technology flows uh, in, the, in the overall market. Uh, global trade is decreasing. Uh, overall, global growth rates are uh, in general declining. In the light of this uncertainty in the markets, uh, there is the two countries uh, coming together does send a number of signals, positive signals for the stock exchanges, for the markets uh, and so on. Uh, there is uh, a recent uh, news that it is likely that India will sign the uh, RCEP the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. Uh, there are a number of discussions that are happening in the recent times, uh, which suggest to the uh, India and China intensifying the globalization aspect. The second other uh, aspect that brings both India and China together is the multipolarity. Uh, so India and China are part of the Russian-led Russia-China-India trilateral uh, on collaboration in the United Nations. Um, there is also the uh, BRICS, which also has a number of uh, common programs, uh, including in the IMF reorganization in terms of the voting rights. Uh, and finally, there is also the basic coordination, Brazil, South Africa, India, China coordination in climate change proposals, which we think is also a major issue where India and China could collaborate. Although, China is a large polluting country in the world. China pollutes something like 20 billion tons, while we pollute 
something like one point uh, something like five point one billion tons, uh, a quarter of what China is polluting the uh, the uh, global environmental domains. Yet we are collaborating with China in this format of equal but differentiated responsibilities, meaning that the industrialized West should take more uh, in terms of the green technologies, green budgets, and so on and so forth, while the G77 countries will have to uh, uh, gradually uh, focus on the climate change issues. So I guess uh, there is a whole lot of issues that, uh, that come up for them, for the leaderships tomorrow. Um, let us uh, uh, see what the spokespersons mention tomorrow uh, on these issues. And uh, uh, the fact that both are coming together in the maritime area now in Chennai, closer to Chennai, Mahabalipuram, uh, it also opens up new areas of cooperation in the maritime domain. Uh, so this is the signaling that the second informal summit meeting is providing. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Professor Kondapalli. I think you have uh, very beautifully outlined the uh, likely contours of uh, the uh, summit that's going to take place. And there are many new issues uh, which have uh, come up. Uh, I you know, pass on the uh, floor to uh, Mr. Rangachari, but with one uh, question, and we would like to answer that. There is quite obviously a huge potential and it's not that it has not been recognized because the leaders have met so very often and for the last 20 years I think there's been a tremendous in, uh, effort on both sides to manage the relationship, build certain confidence etc. But uh, the potential remains uh, largely unutilized. So what are the reasons that uh, this potential remains uh, unutilized? And uh, Rangachari, of course, knows China very well. Maybe he could throw some light on the mindsets, uh, Indian mindset and the Chinese mindset. When we approach these uh, uh, meetings at that level, what is the mindset that is at uh, work? So, Mr. Rangachari, sir. Thank you. <coughs> <coughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Gupta. First, I want to thank uh, the Vice Chancellor and uh, Shastra University and uh, the Vivekananda International Foundation and Dr. Gupta for this opportunity to be here. Uh, it's, it's, it's always a pleasure to be back home and I'm delighted to see uh, even some of my family members here. So it's, it's, it's very good to be back home. Uh, I will come to the question that uh, Dr. Gupta raised. Um, uh, we have just heard a very masterly, masterful uh, account of uh, what very well might be uh, what transpires tomorrow and day after between Xi Jinping and uh, Modi uh, from uh, uh, Professor Kondapalli. I want to take this to a slightly broader level of uh, India-China relations in their totality. But first, the question that the Vice Chancellor raised in regard to the civilizational aspect. You know, this was a theme that my Chinese teacher, Professor Tan Jung, has worked on for a very long time. And I'd be happy to give you some of the references of the books that he's published, which are published here in India, available here. He is now uh, back in Chankra. A very, uh, just to digress a little bit, his father worked with Rabindranath Tagore in uh, Shantini Ketan, where China Bhavan was established in 1937. And he was a little boy uh, at that time. Then he lived and taught in Delhi University, where he was my teacher. And then he went to JNU, also in Delhi University. And then after retirement, moved away to the United States. And now he's back again in China. Um, see, there are two separate ways in which this 
question could be addressed. One is the civilizational way of approaching each other, and the other is the Westphalia way. Both of which you mentioned, but both of them have their own uh, trajectory. If you are looking at it civilizationally, you know Professor Kondapalli was giving instances about the very uh, historic experience that the Chinese have of Indian culture. Professor Chisian Lin, who is the doyen of India studies in Peking University, passed away some years ago. He was uh, when when Pranam Mukherjee visited uh, China as president, he awarded the Padma Shri to him. He wrote that the in imprint of the Indian culture is so deep on the Chinese soul that there is no way in which it can be taken out. I remember being present at a meeting between Chiang Zemin and President Narayanan some 20 years ago. When Chiang Zemin talked in terms of how as a little boy, his mother would take him to a Buddhist temple and he would love to ring the bell in the temple. Of course, he said, I don't believe in, in, in any god and I'm atheist and so on. But he still recalled that experience from his childhood. And there are any number of even tourist sites. In near, near Hangzhou, there is a place, Fei Lai Feng. The story is about how a mountain flew from India to China. And this again is a story which goes back about 2000 years. We don't have the time, so I won't go into the details of that. But there is a great deal of civilizational impact. Buddhism is one, but beyond Buddhism. Uh, if you see the newspapers in the last two or three days, they even talk in terms of how there were traces of Tamil culture, Tamil architecture found in Fujian. And this goes back to 8th century. So, you know, going back 2000 years, then you come to the 8th century, then you come closer and closer. They have also been very bad experiences where Indian troops during the British days in India were used against the Chinese in China. So there are mixed experiences, but insofar as the richness of the civilizational influence is concerned, there, how do you treat the Himalayas? Is that a barrier or is that something that joins India and China? There were some excavations which are done in, in Chengtu and a uh, place called Sansingtwe. And there they found a bird. It is the city symbol of uh, Chengtu. And that symbol, according to again, my professor, Professor Thanju, he says this is nothing but Garuda. Of course, the Chinese disputed. <laughs> but this is the kind of impact, civilizational impact. But then if you are having that kind of civiliz civilizational impact as the basis of your relationship, then we should not be having territorial disputes because civilizations are not constrained by boundaries. They transcend boundaries. On the other hand, you have got Westphalia. And Westphalia is a recent phenomenon in 1648. That becomes territory. And if you are territorial, then it is inevitable that if there is a difference between one and another neighboring state, you would have a dispute. Which is probably why now the, the oft repeated uh, mantra in uh, India China relations is don't allow differences to become disputes. I do want to say something about. Uh, the boundary issue, but maybe a little later because I, I want to put this in a larger perspective, the relationship between India and China. You, know, you go back 70 years when uh, India became independent and when the PRC emerged uh, in 1949. It was a very different world. It was a world which is dominated by, still dominated by the victors of the Second World War. You had a world order which had been constructed by the victors of 
the Second World War. So you see the Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, the United Nations, the United Nations Security Council, a variety of other institutions that came into existence around that time and which have basically been the framework within which the world order has operated and the powers which won the Second World War were the ones who defined the framework and how it should operate. So at one level you had democracy, you had individual liberties, at another level you had market economy and at a third level you had the dominance of the powers that were powers at that time. And in the last 70 years, there has been a huge transformation. When the United Nations was established in 1945, there were just 51 countries, 51 member countries. We were fortunate that even though we were not independent, we became one of the original members of the United Nations. Today, there are 193 countries. And almost all of these are decolonized countries which won their freedom since the Second World War. And the last of them, I think, was South Africa in 1981. So 40, 45 to 81, almost 40 year time span, it took for all the countries in the world to become independent. The economy was dominated by the few developed countries that existed at that time, again, drawing very largely upon their imperial past and the fact that they had been able to develop on the basis of the richness and resources of the countries which they colonized. Today, you see a world which is very different. You see Europe. Europe is stagnating. You see successive reports of the European Central Bank and they are trying to raise the inflation level in Europe to beyond 1% and not always succeed. Brexit, if it comes about, is going to have one more very crucial blow at the entire process of integration of Europe. The trend that started about, you know, with the European coal and steel community, then after the, the European common market and gradually successive uh, agreements and treaties, Maastricht and so on. The trend was towards integration. Once Brexit comes about, then it's not only going to be Britain, but a number of other disenchanted countries within the European Union who have a very strong feeling against Brussels, the headquarters of the European Commission who might want to assert themselves and say, do this or we don't want to be part. As it is, the currency union is, is not does not extend to all the 29 members of the European Union. You look at the United States today, it's in transition. Many of the commitments that the United States undertook post-World War, under the presidency of Trump, they are receding from many of them. And you look at the curiosity. For something like 70 years, India has been against any imperial overreach. India has been against the presence of the United States in the Indian Ocean, in bases in Indian Ocean and so on. Today, we take a very different position. And the reason for that is very clear. Our interests, as we saw it, Back in 1947 or 1950s or 60s or 70s, and our interests as we see today are not the same in relation to the United States. I remember when I was in the United Nations attending several meetings of the Indian Ocean Committee, a proposal that had been mooted by Sri Lanka of all countries to make Indian Ocean a zone of peace. And the biggest critics of India at that time, and this goes back about 40 years now, used to be the Australians. Today, Australians want to join India 
in naval exercise you joining malabar and become part of the more active part of the quad so how is this relevant in the context of india china relations we have to be conscious that just as we want to lay down our interests by ourselves and we want to protect those interests in the same way others including china would want to lay down their own interests and would want to protect them some years ago if you remember 2011 sachin tendulkar was looking for his 100th century and there was an india australia series he didn't get his 100th century there he got it in 2012 in bangladesh so should we blame the australians that they didn't allow sachin tendulkar to make his 100th century or should we look at our own preparation and say we have to do what we need to do in order to protect our interests once you look at it from that perspective a lot of the issues that we are talking about now whether it is the fact that uh, uh, the trade deficit issue whether you look at the enormous military power that china has accumulated and how it affects us you know uh, about 6 uh, or 7 years ago uh, when 2010 2010 um, at the shangri la dialogue the then chinese defense minister liang kuang yi he was asked this question about china's military power by the way today china is the second largest spender in so far as military expenditure is concerned after the united states somewhere around 100 120 billion dollars right 190 and the americans are somewhere around 800 or so 750 800 something like that he was asked this question as to why china would want to spend so much money on defense and his answer was that the west has four generation weapons going on to the fifth generation we have only second generation weapons we are going on to the third generation and therefore nobody should have reason to complain and this is for the defense of china and so on. but where are china's differences and disputes they are all with countries in this region who are not even at the first generation level of weaponry let alone second and third generation so it is natural that countries which are smaller which have take south china sea is a good example uh they would have some concern in regard to what you are going to do with this enormous military power that you accumulate around the same time there was also a statement and if my memory does not fail me it was yang chetri who was then the uh, state council who said this at that time the china asean trade was around 400 billion dollars to it and you know, there is all the time there is this talk about how you create an economic stake then it's much easier to handle disputes south china sea's dispute was very active at that time and the chinese side made the statement that just because we have a robust economic relationship does not mean that we will give up on our core interests so that is the reality of how china thinks about its own interests and as i said chinese interests are defined by china itself and just as we would not want others to define our interests and we have resisted this fiercely over the last 70 years so would the chinese not want others to define their interests so how do we deal with that we have to look at chinese interests as defined by the chinese we have to look at the indian interests as defined by india how can we work together where can we work together and if there are differences how do we manage those differences so that as i mentioned the mantra differences do not become disputes let me just because we don't have enough time maybe let's just take three issues one is the question of the trade deficit the other is the border and the third is the latest from 370 
on trade the total surplus global surplus that china runs is around 350 billion dollars last year 2018 india contributed 57 billion of that 350 so that works out to what about 17 uh 15 16% that's a very sizable contribution but then let's not forget we also run huge surpluses with our own members so if you are complaining about chinese trade deficit which we can legitimately do and try and see if there's not some way in which this can be Uh, addressed in a way which is which better suits our interests at the same time we should then also be prepared to pay heed when there are complaints against us from our own neighbors currently there is a huge amount of talk in terms of the us china trade war and the total two way trade between those two countries is around 750 billion dollars the chinese are ahead in terms of goods trade the americans are ahead in terms of services trade now what the americans are trying to do in terms of opening up the chinese market something which we have also been trying and not succeeded very well if the americans succeed it will benefit us also and therefore clearly we have good reason to hope that the chinese market will be more accessible to indian businesses than what it has been but at the same time we also have to be conscious and i think this is something that our business our industry people whether it is the cii or fiki or asocham or psd chamber and i'm sure the chambers here in tamil nadu will be saying the same to the government whether it is taxes whether it is cost of land whether it is cost of electricity whether it is cost of labor a variety of issues which are directly responsible for the cost of doing business in india should also be addressed so just focusing on the fact that we are running a huge deficit with one country and mind you we are running a surplus with the united states so would we listen to the united states and want to bring down our surplus with the us because the americans are complaining so we have to be more competitive in the market there are any number of diwali will be coming this now and i'm sure all of us know this is no open secret that probably many of the uh, gods and goddesses that we will be praying to will be made in china so if we are not competitive if we are not we are going to get to that level of fairly inconsequential items of trade and even hand that over to another country whichever it may be we are not doing ourselves a service so in the first instance we must look inwards and see where am i going wrong how can i change things here it's only when i'm totally satisfied that i'm doing everything right and i am still getting out for a duck then i must either change my batting style or i'm stop playing the game all together in so far as the border question is concerned this has been under discussion since the 50s and in 60 61 there was a very voluminous uh, there were in fact three rounds of talks a very voluminous report was produced out of that there is not a single detail that is not in the public domain in regard to the border issue we know for example that <clears throat> we believe that assai chin belongs to india as part of the state of jammu and kashmir and the chinese say that the entire state of arunachal pradesh belongs to china there are parliament resolutions in india which says that not an inch of territory should be conceded and similarly the chinese I, I don't know that there is any uh, national people's congress resolution on the subject but clearly the chinese position is that they are not willing to consider it 
Now, if you have two positions solidified over several decades in this fashion, what kind of a solution can we have? There was a formula which was proposed in first back in, in the 50s by Chon Lai, who said that we'll recognize McMahon line, even though we don't accept it. It is an imperialist line, etc. and so on. But we are willing to accept. And they did that in the case of Burma. So there is a precedent. The obvious was that India should accept that Aksai Chin is, is Chinese territory. Uh, then in 1979, when Atal Bihari Vajpayee as the uh, foreign minister of the Janata government went to China, consumer being said that we should have a settlement on an as is various basis. And then again, there was a repeat of this offer when Rajiv Gandhi visited in 1988. And that's 30 years ago. This offer is no longer on the table. There is no as is, where is offer from the Chinese side. And of course, we did not accept as is, where is back in the 50s. And since then, there have been several other developments, resolutions, policy statements, etc. and so on. So we are not willing to accept that today. So there are only two alternatives. Either we should militarily take over Aksai Chin or they should militarily take over Arunachal Pradesh and that would be the end of the dispute. Or you leave the status quo as it is. Disadvantages to both in terms of their stated positions but acknowledging the ground reality and manage the situation in a way in which you do not have any active confrontation. In 2013, there was a very major violation. In 2014, again, there was a very major violation. In 2014, when Xi Jinping had come, he was received first in Gujarat. Uh, at that time, this was pointed out to the Chinese side. And today, five years down the line, we have not had a repeat of that. So it is possible, Dr. Gupta was mentioning about the strategic guidance flowing from the Wuhan summit being given to the armed forces and so on. It is possible to avoid confrontations of that nature where one army or another army, Indians have not been guilty of this, though. I must say that for the record, where the Chinese soldiers would come and sit in what is considered to by the Indian side as Indian territory over a prolonged period of 10 days, 15 days, 20 days. And even though no shot is fired, it's a source of enormous adverse public reaction towards China. And the Chinese side must recognize that. Clearly, they do, because this last five years, as I mentioned, there has been no repeat. Duklam is slightly different, because that's not a direct India-China border issue. But still, the impact has been very adverse. We are still talking about it two years down the line. So the important thing is, and this is what the various arguments that Dr. Kundupalli was mentioning about, and I was associated with some of them. Uh, this is what the aim of the confidence building measures was. To prevent military activity along the line of control which would be in any way a matter of concern to the other side, avoid any kind of patrolling or other activity which would bring the troops face to face in a confrontational way. Yes, even now they come face to face, but usually they say you go back, you go back and both sides go back and that's the end of the matter. So totally as a practical proposition, and this does not in terms of international law affect the position of principle that either side might have. Both sides have to make an effort to ensure that there is no confrontation. And since 67, Chumbi Valley, Sikkim and so on, since 1967, not a shot has been fired. 
on the india china border areas if we can maintain that and if we can maintain peace and tranquility along the border areas even if the disputes continue to remain it should not have an adverse effect on the bilateral relationship whether we can resolve this i personally don't see that any resolution is possible given the position that both sides have taken which is a position from which neither is willing to resign and neither has the military capability and i dare say the military intention of moving forward to resolve this issue militarily so the best that we can hope for is to maintain peace and tranquility some of the issues like border personnel meetings back in 1996 we had negotiated an agreement under which the sinkiang military district and the kashmir military district northern command they would have meetings and the meetings would take place on the indian side in kashmir the chinese never implemented that so you do run into problems even when you have an agreement but you have to keep trying you have to increase the border personnel meetings you have to create confidence between the two militaries that it is not worth their while and certainly it's not going to resolve the border issue to be going about into a shooting confrontation along one or another sector and the bigger issue is i certainly say this the confidence in so far as india is concerned but i'm also willing to venture this this is china's position that neither wants to have a war on the borders both sides are wanting to have peace and tranquility in the border areas and therefore while we blame the chinese side which is fair enough we should also give them credit that in the course of the last what is it now uh, 67 33 and 19 52 years we have not had a situation where we would have to fight each other and if this can prevail for another 50 years hopefully we would have got to a higher level of relations 370 370 if you look at the uh, chronology the chinese are basically misinformed they have got carried away with the pakistani position and they have endorsed it and that's purely a political position first of all china was not a member of the un security council when the resolution relating to jammu and kashmir were adopted these date back to 1947 48 china became a member only in 1971 and at the time when china joined the un it made a statement that it would look at all the resolutions and see which one they would subscribe to because if they were not a member they don't they're not obligated to be a party to this that is one legal act political i don't see how the chinese can support pakistan in fact i can't even see how the pakistanis can keep harping on the un resolutions because the first step in the un resolution is restoration of all the areas occupied by pakistan to indian administration pakistan occupied kashmir northern areas gilgit baltistan they have to restore all of this to indian administration before the second step can be gone into and the second step is for the indian administration to restore normalcy in this entire area and only then the third step of the referendum comes so how has pakistan got away over a period of 70 years in making it out as if the un resolutions favor their stand on jammu and kashmir is something that we need to expose to the world it's probably our fault because when we said in in the mid 50s that we will not implement the un resolutions we did not mean that we would not take back or we do not want to take back the areas occupied by pakistan we simply meant that referendum would not be issued but even today if we were to say okay as a first step you please restore the areas under your control to india does anyone in india or in pakistan believe that pakistan is going to do that 
Call their bluff. And the Chinese are wrong in not having their, these resolutions. I have said this to Chinese uh, scholars last month uh, in, a, in a meeting we had where there were two dozen of them came. And I said, please go study the resolution and see, uh, does it make sense for you to support this proposition? Now, let's look at it from another point. What have the Chinese said? The three elements are UN Charter, UN resolutions, and bilateral arrangements. This is between India and Pakistan. They said this at the United Nations when uh, they asked for a, a, a meeting, a closed door meeting. And again, let's be a little charitable. Pakistan is a, what is it, uh, 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 what is it, the uh, uh, ally, uh, and all, 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 yes, all with a friend, all, all, no, all with a, uh -huh. all with a, uh -huh. now, Chinese are under pressure, having invested a huge amount, 50, 60 billion dollars, whatever, or about to invest 50, 60 billion dollars there, and clearly Pakistan is a useful instrument in this region. Can we realistically think of China being in a position to resist that pressure? So what does China do? China takes the least cost option. It goes for a closed door meeting. It doesn't ask for the statement by a president. It doesn't ask for a resolution or nothing. It says its peace in that closed door meeting. Pakistan says its peace in the closed door meeting. And that's the end of the matter as far as UN Security Council is concerned. Then you take the chronology, 6th of August, Imran Khan lands up in, in, uh, in, in China. 5th of August, the Rajya Sabha passes the resolution, 6th of August, he lands up there. And on the 11th of August, uh, make, that will make Pakistan feel that it has been let down by its only friend, uh, China. <clears throat> so they have done a balancing act. And what they have said yesterday in the joint statement, it is not very different from what they said two months ago. When we conduct relationship with other countries, as I said earlier, we must look at their interests. We must look at, we don't have to defend those interests, but we must look at their interests and see how we can accommodate our interests in a way in which it doesn't lead to a confrontation. If it does no material harm to us, we should be able to take that in our stride. Tell them. In fact, keep on telling them. You are wrong on this. But does not mean that you have to lead to a break. By saying that unless you change your position, I am not willing to be friends with you. In the larger context, again, in the global context, today, China also needs India. And for some time now, the big Chinese worry has been how close India is willing to go, get to with the Americans. Because they see America as wanting to contain China. Right or wrong is not for discussion just now. This is how they look upon the United States. They want peace and stability in this region and their statement that Xi Jinping himself has made in party forum and elsewhere saying this. So if you trust one statement of Xi Jinping, you can trust another statement of Xi Jinping also. They want to have a relationship with India which stands them in good stead. Because without India's participation and in the face of India's opposition, it's very difficult for them to get very far with countries in South Asia region. And if India can participate cooperatively with China, they would see that as an advantage. By all means, look at these. By all means, let us see how we can derive some advantage in going along with the Chinese. If we see we cannot derive any advantage, we don't have to play that game. 
in the context of the belt and road initiative we have made very clear by the way it's still in in chinese it's still one belt one road in english it is called belt and road initiative but in chinese it is still one belt one road this initiative doesn't suit us we say no the chinese are not happy with that but they are willing to live with it they still think that some way they will be able to persuade us if we do find reason to go along with the proposition and we see some advantage in it maybe we will but if we don't we won't so the basic point i am making is let us look at our interests let us see how best we can derive benefit from the chinese side uh, investments will be a slow process what is promised doesn't get delivered in that time frame and this is not true only in the case of china it's true in the case of a large number of western countries also because there again what i was saying earlier about the conditions we create the environment we create there is a story today about uh, safran wanting to build aircraft engines in india when i was ambassador in paris the french say chairman of safran said the same thing to me it's now 13 years 14 years and they are still saying the same thing they have not built a single aircraft engine in india so we have to also look at it and see are we doing what we should be doing the right way now this question that uh, dr gupta raised about uh, being below the potential yes it is well below the potential to some extent this is inevitable because our interests in chinese interests do not overlap in such a congruous manner across the board that we can carry it to very much higher levels at the same time there are interests for example in transforming the global structure global order in a way that it would suit our interests our interests here i mean both india and china and there is an interview that xi jinping had given in 2013 in which he had said that we are not interested in overthrowing the world order we want to bring about the change taking into account the current realities and he was he was talking from a chinese perspective but if you substitute india for china we would have said much the same thing we are not interested in overthrowing the world order but we want to bring in modifications that would be opportunity now there again you look at the security council we want to be on the security council the chinese are not willing to commit their support to us so even within this overall perspective of wanting to bring about a beneficial change in the global order in the global structures there are differences and we are not on the same side so still such time as these kinds of differences of approach remain while there is agreement in principle we have disagreements in regard to details in one or another aspect maybe multiple aspects it will be difficult to carry the relationship to its full potential but that is no argument for not making the effort today to the fullest possible extent in the hope that it could be reciprocated reciprocated in the fullest measure from the other side and this kind of informal summit permits you to do precisely that where without any commitment on either side because you are not tied down with any kind of a set agenda you are not any compulsion to sign formal agreements and so on to get to have a better understanding of each other these kinds of informal summits help there are precedents of this the, during the yeltsin years we used to have these tireless summits with the japanese we didn't manage to solve the problem of the northern islands uh, as a territorial dispute between japan and russia and first soviet union then russia going back to the second world war but it was a forum where they could freely exchange views nothing very much came out of it but that is for different reasons so this is a process that should be encouraged it should be looked at with hope at the same time not have too high expectations that problems which could not be resolved over a period of time are going to get resolved because of the beautiful setting of 
Mahamal Lakram <laughs> because of the fact that the summit is informal and both sides are therefore receptive to each other. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rangachari, for that uh, wonderful overview and those uh, very uh, important insights uh, that you have given, which uh, come only because of your uh, deep experience of uh, watching the Sino Indian relationship for uh, such a long time. Uh, I do not know how many minutes do we have, but we'd like to have some interaction with how many minutes do we have? 15 minutes. So we can take a few questions uh, from the audience and kindly raise your hands, be very brief and uh, identify uh, who you want to uh, ask your question. Yes, please. I'm Ramesh Kumar, ex-student of JNU also in School of International Languages, Foreign Languages, School of Foreign Languages. Just, I want to put one question to Dr. Srikanth Kondapli. That Doklam Ro, what are, what were the background reasons due to which it sparked off and flared up? What are the immediate reasons and now that it is buried or that you are comfortable, would you please disclose how, what the intricacies which went into that to resolve that problem, how it was resolved. We will take a few questions together. Second, second thing is, regarding the Anachal Pradesh, just one small question, but frequently there is a uh, dictates from China that uh, what India should do in uh, Arunachal Pradesh and what it should not do, do's and don't do. So, how this uh, issue can be resolved? And what is the status at present? Yeah. There. My, my name is Surya Narayan. I'm an academic. All the four speakers, including the Vice Chancellor, started with China and India being civilizational states. In this context, and reminded of a famous statement by Professor Arnold Toynbee, who said, in the end, the current of Chinese expansion will meet the current of Indian expansion in the area in between them, namely Southeast Asia, the Chinese called the Nanya or the Southern Seas. And in the end, it will go in favor of China at the cost of India. The statement seems to be something like a prophecy. Whether the prophecy will come true or not, I would love the panelists to mention. The second one, it's very brief. China believes, and perhaps with certain amount of justification, that India is a part of the US attempt to quarantine and isolate China. And if we do not wriggle out of this situation, and follow a foreign policy which gives a strategic and autonomy, I do not think that we will be able to solve the border problem. Thank you. Dr. Nadijari, yeah? only one small, maybe hypothetical. Um, America was using China to check Russia. No, why not? Maybe hypothetical. India can join with China and Russia to prevent the influence of America in this region. Yes. Can I? Uh, I'll just, I just quickly. Uh, no, no, ask. here, here, please. Yeah. Sir, Doctor, sir, one question. Actually, tomorrow, the agenda, whether. Prime Minister and President of China, they are going to discuss Pakistan issue and Doklok issue. It is going to happen. If it is happen, it is successful for India and China, both the side. We are welcome of it. This is all. The gentleman there. Can I? Yeah. 
good evening i am subramanian professor spoke about uh, our cooperation with china on uh, various fronts recently there was a news uh, report that uh, the universities which are going to sign a memorandum of understanding with chinese will have to go through the security clearances from mha will these things not be an impediment that is one or at one point we speak about cooperation at the other end we speak about uh, clearances and other things i would like to have clarifications okay. from you thank you here yeah. uh sir uh, with so much of a hype uh of the meeting that is going to happen tomorrow and day after and we are discussing this i think this is the first time we have ever discussed about the sino indian relationship at the backdrop of that meeting that is happening tomorrow so is it this hype going to help resolve most of the issues again it's uh, similar to this hypothetical question most of the issues may be uh, looking at from the broader perspective between these two countries all the issues you had discussed were very uh, i mean it was impressive but is it going to resolve the and calm down most of the uh, uh, issues that we look at as normal citizens and want to have better relationship with the countries thank you let me go back to the panel uh thank you mr chairman um uh, uh, very interesting questions thank you very much for raising the, all of them um on the last question straight away uh, whether we will see any of these discussed tomorrow and day after um whether pakistan kashmir um, other issues are going to be i don't i do not think those will be discussed or resolved um in one meeting these long standing issues are never resolved in any uh, but let me say uh, this is good news for chennai uh the second informal meeting and that's why i said congratulations to chennai and its suburbs including uh, mahabalipuram uh, the reason being that the focus of this informal summit meeting will be in the economic sphere in the commercial sphere uh, and we are likely to see uh, at least three announcements in terms of the railway projects uh, there is a long standing uh, project where the ministry of railways had looked at chennai to new delhi and that has been shortened to chennai to nagpur high speed railway project at a cost of 36 billion dollars uh, there are differences uh, in terms of the uh, <coughs> the interest rates uh the period of uh, construction uh, what are the conditions etc uh, on this and the security um, for example the ministry of railways in delhi had sent a delegation to china but they were not allowed to go and see the security systems of the uh, for example if there is a uh, if there is a uh, accident railway accident in india the first casualty is the railway minister he has to resign <laughs> so he is unlikely to sign an mou with china where there are two major accidents involving a high speed railway one is in wenchou and other is in shantung province uh, unlike the shinkansen of japan which has a zero percentage of accidents throughout its history china had two major accidents in which nearly about 600 people died in these two accidents so if uh, uh, we adopt that kind of model we have a problem with the signaling system and the others so one is a high speed railway project with chennai as the focus starting point the second is signals uh, facilities for the railways again in which china made major strides a third possible announcement would be in the sphere of smart cities Uh, as chennai faced a lot of problems in terms of water uh, in terms of the flooding in terms of uh, pollution and a host of other issues transportation smart city construction uh, is one other area where there will be a, uh, a major announcement uh, tomorrow or the day after uh, so uh, it is good news for china they will not be able to discuss where the line of actual control is between india and china tomorrow i can assure you it will take at least 14 to 15 years which means a 16th informal summit meeting or a 17th informal summit meeting will solve the territorial dispute and we are talking about 10 other items right 
So that may take a hundred years. France and England resolved all of their problems after a hundred years. And India and China only 70 years now. Uh, so 30 more years are left for us. Uh, and so uh, on Doklam, what happened in Doklam? Sushma Swaraj, the then foreign minister, the late foreign minister, uh, she mentioned in the Rajya Sabha why India had gone and placed those patrols to counter Chinese patrols in the uh, Zamferi Ridge uh, in Bhutan China border areas. She mentioned two reasons why we had sent troops. One is that we are invoking the 2012 agreement between Bhutan and India. Article 2 of this mentions about India protecting the national interest of Bhutan, which includes obviously the territorial dispute between the two. Bhutan has complained and approached India saying that its territorial dispute has been, uh, uh, the, the territory has been violated by the Chinese troops. So that is one reason why we went and rescued the Bhutanese uh, in that Doklam incident. Number two reason, from our own security point of view, China has been constructing a role on top uh, to neutralize our own military strength as well as to strategically go towards the Siliguri corridor. That was the second reason why we went to place our troops uh, in the Doklam area. What happened in Doklam? Uh, China launched three warfares. One is psychological warfare. Second is legal warfare. They outlined the 1890 treaty between Sikkim and Qing dynasty. Uh, but they did not mention whether that has been ratified their respective parliaments or uh, any other legitimate authorities. Uh, the uh, third warfare China waged was the uh, media warfare. Uh, you may have seen the Xinhua News Agency clipping um, uh, lampooning Sardarji's Sikh community in India because they constitute nearly one fourth of the Indian army. Uh, the Xinhua News Agency took it to the uh, extreme in a racist manner uh, in this Doklam incident in the media warfare. Uh, psychological warfare, uh, legal warfare, these three warfares they waged, but we just stood without mentioning anything in that area. In that on that issue, except what Sushma Swaraj mentioned in the Rajya Sabha meeting. Uh, Arun Jetli, who also passed away, was the then half defense minister, half finance minister. He said 2017 is not 1962. Then uh, Rajnath Singh, the then home minister at the time, he also mentioned in a similar manner. There was no uh, uh, then the uh, defense minister Nirmala Sitharaman also had similar views. So India kept quiet. On the other hand, China ratcheted up during the Doklam crisis. Uh, how it was resolved? The By August 2017, it was almost nearly uh, since June, the, uh, the number of troops kept on increasing, decreasing. Uh, maximum 400 troops were placed by either side. Uh, finally, the the Xiamen meeting of the BRICS was due by September 2017 and the foreign ministry in India did not mention whether Prime Minister Modi will be attending the BRICS meeting or not. No confirmation, no denial, no, no none of this happened. So it also resulted in the Chinese climbing down and the situation also was problematic for China because of the winter setting in and other reasons. So finally, the Doklam crisis petered away. Okay. I, I mentioned two reasons why India had gone according to the version of the government of India. So I think that should be the reasons. On Arunachal Pradesh, um, the technically Arunachal Pradesh is a disputed territory under the India China discussions. Technically, Aksai Chin is a disputed territory between India and China. 
So when Amit Shah mentions in the Lok Sabha that Aksai Chin and POK are disputed areas where we have a claim, he is saying the right thing by saying this is a, a content, contentious issue. This is a disputed territory. Technically, that's a disputed territory. So I think he was raising uh, in a legal format because there is no dispute resolution on any one of these issues. Uh, so, in other words, the uh, Chinese position, uh, but of course, they could not say why India is doing what it is doing in Arunachal Pradesh. This all happened when Ambassador Sun Yushi in November 2006 mentioned to an NDA, uh, to, a, uh, to a CNN, IBN uh, uh, interview, uh, where he mentioned the whole area that you call as Arunachal Pradesh is disputed. So while in 1960, Chawanlai said the McMahon line is a disputed territory, the whole area then 90,000 square kilometers from 2006 becomes the disputed territory. That's a revision in the Chinese position on the Arunachal Pradesh. Previously, on the, only the line was problem, but now the whole territory becomes a problem from a uh, so that, uh, on the other hand, uh, whether China can say who has to go or who should not go into Arunachal Pradesh, if the Chinese say this, then we also have to say who goes into Aksai Chin, who does not go into Aksai Chin. So that we have not been saying for some reason. So that has to be uh, corrected. Uh, on Southeast Asia, as the uh, hub of the uh, India-China competition or cooperation, uh, you have seen that in the last Republic Day, we had 10 ASEAN members, uh, presidents, prime ministers, monarchs came and attended the meeting. Uh, there is a concern within the ASEAN about China's role, especially in the South China Sea issue. Uh, so while we have seen the contest in the Southeast Asian region, uh, India's stock actually is going up in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asian Sea, in Go Chuk Tong's words, uh, as a balancer to China, the former premier of uh, Singapore. So I think in terms of the, on uh, US containment uh, of China, I think this is all propaganda from China. In globalization, no country can contain another country. Between US and China today, there are 6,000 people going from here and there. Between India and China, there are only 300 people who are going from China to India or India to China. In such a situation, you cannot have containment. Number two, China-US trade is $580 billion. India-China trade is $94 billion. There is no way US can contain China or not China can contain US. Uh, uh, the other is the ideological. Today, US is uh, in a way, uh, uh, part of the globalization, China is part of the globalization. Uh, I think we need to be uh, more sensitive on this. Uh, today, in the age of globalization, no country can contain the other. If somebody says, I'm being contained, I think you should calm them down and say, how are you trading with them? How are you doing so many? Uh, China, U.S., have so many strategic interests and strategic cooperation on G2, as Obama spoke to the Chinese Premier Wen Xiaopao, Group 2, uh, on North Korea, on Iran, on a host of other issues, uh, security and strategic issues. There is actually an understanding between US and China. But if China is saying, playing to the galleries that it is being contained by the US, I think there is a problem in that. And we should not buy this argument. Uh, China uses this for its own national interest. We sometimes fall prey as the 1172 resolution in the Security Council. US and China passed those to uh, the resolution against the Indian nuclear test. Uh, so I think we need to be careful on the concept of US containment. There is no containment. They have a problem, bilateral problem, which has to be resolved. The 19th Party Congress of the Communist Party in 2017 said they want to be occupying the center stage of global politics. 
which is a clear threat to the U.S. leadership position. So that is the problem, the China-U.S. problem. It is not India's problem. Uh, uh, so I'll just skip the other. Uh, on the MHRD, uh, Ministry of Human Resource Development Circular, uh, on uh, academic exchanges and so on, I think this is an administrative uh, mechanism. Uh, every country, US, China, Japan, every other country has some regulations on how to interact. So I don't think this is a, uh, a new thing. Um, we do not see what exactly they want the MOUs to be signed, etc. But this is an administrative regulation. If the UGC is paying Shastra University uh, in terms of any, Shastra University has to listen to the UGC. It's simple. Uh, as Hillary Clinton once said, uh, how can you shout on your banker <laughs> to, the, to the Chinese side? So, uh, if any any university is funded by the UGC, UGC has some administrative regulations. Period. Well, uh, I think uh, we'll have to uh, bring the discussion to a close here because we have to now leave for the airport almost uh, immediately. Otherwise, you will miss the flight. I'm sorry, we can't take any more questions. Uh, there is. Uh, Hardly anything that I can add to this uh, brilliant uh, presentations that have already been given. Uh, the I think uh, two uh, global leaders, Modi ji and President Xi, they have their plate full, and uh, informal summit means that uh, they can discuss anything. So there are a lot of uh, issues that uh, will be discussed. But perhaps uh, uh, they will be approaching this uh, like uh, the chess players because there's so many factors, so many, uh, so many uh, pieces are in play that uh, when one wrong move and you will have a uh, issue. But I'm sure the celebrious surroundings of Mamala Puram and this uh, lovely uh, setting that has been provided. And that's why this informal summit uh, is also uh, a, some kind of a bomb that will uh, be there. But I think the important point which has come out uh, of uh, this discussion is that don't expect any breakthroughs on core issues. And there could be divergences on core issues. And yet there is a lot that can happen uh, which can benefit uh, the people and which can take the relationship forward because the two countries want to build on that relationship and they don't want uh, they want to manage the relationship and they have uh, learned the art of managing that as was pointed out even in the boundary there have been you know hardly any incidents in the last few years but uh, the politics and the geopolitics and national interest core interests etc they will all come into play and i think uh, both sides will uh, defend their national interests and yet i think the civilizational connect which is somewhere in the back of their mind would probably help and uh, mitigate uh, the uh, divergences. And this informal summit might uh, help create uh, more uh, unconvergences. So let's look towards this uh, informal summit and the subsequent ones that you mentioned to come with great hope uh, and uh, enthusiasm. So thank you very much. And I want to thank the Vice Chancellor once again for organizing this wonderful uh, interaction and for all the hospitality and warmth in their shown us. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. As a token of our gratitude on behalf of Shastra University, may I invite Dr. Vaidya Subramanyam to present mementos to all our three panelists.
vote of thanks thank you very much i would like to make it very simple and short first of all on behalf of the state of tamil nadu let me first uh, thank the uh, heads of the states uh, prime minister uh, modi as well as uh, president xi jinping for agreeing to meet at mahabalipuram and tomorrow if uh, history recalls any progress between india china relationship definitely tamil nadu will find a mention in this historic uh, event that's going to happen thank you very much uh, vivekananda international foundation for joining with shastra to organize this event a big round of applause to the speakers themselves who took that time off thank you very much thank you very much the audience and the uh, hotel authorities friends from the uh, print and the electronic media for coming in this number and supporting this event to my chinese friends uh, see you see you thank you very much everybody thank you